Thank you, Tim. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll plan to follow the pattern that you suggested, or just a couple of couple of right. sessions and some questions in between. But um, thank you so much for the tremendous privilege of sharing with you all. I really do appreciate it. And um, uh, as Tim said, when we when we met for lunch, I just was I was getting lunches in uh, all throughout that month. I had lunch with Ian Rawley and <laughs> lunch with Tim and Matt uh, at the same place actually. And um, it was very nice. Yeah, um, as Tim said, a real sense of a common task of um, uh, trying to build great churches in towns and villages and working out how to engage with um, smaller communities, um, some rural communities. Um, but, but more than just a shared a sense of a shared task, a real sense of a, of a shared heart and spirit which um, was such a blessing to me, Tim, uh, to come away from that with, with Phil on that occasion and just sense, um, you know, we, we, we kind of think the same way. There's a, there was a, a shared spirit and heart and so really felt encouraged to see how the Lord might use us to strengthen and encourage one another. And um, I, I really do feel the Lord has given me something to share with you this morning. Um, that's around, I believe, how we can really be positioned as leaders um, and, and as churches at this time. Um, I think you, you got the, uh, you got the pre-reading the pre uh, request just to read through Acts 18, 19 and 20 particularly, because I wanted to just talk about some aspects of the Ephesian church. Um, and I'm sure, like a lot of us, the, the, this, this church in Ephesus has always been um, really fascinating to me. Um, and possibly, well, for a number of reasons, I think, but I guess we have more information and context and detail about this church than, than any of the other New Testament churches. We have, in the chapters that you've read and which, we'll, which I'll share from in a moment, we have the story of its origins and its, and its start. Um, I, I, I've always um, just loved that description in Acts 20 of Paul's very intimate, personal um, farewell time with, with the elders of the church. Uh, we've obviously got the epistle to the church, the most magnificent um, epistle concerning the church in the New Testament. Um, and, then, and then I'm sure, again, like many, I've always loved the pastoral letters and knowing that Timothy had been left in Ephesus um, by Paul with a clear uh, apostolic charge. And then, and then you've got this letter in Revelation that Jesus writes to the church, which um, is surprising in some ways, um, given what else we know about the church. So, so I'd like us to just read a couple of sections from each of the chapters in a moment, but just by way of sort of background and reminder and context, Acts 18 is um, Paul's second missionary trip, um, starting around about AD 50. He goes from Athens to Corinth, meets Aquila and Priscilla, uh, preach, as, as he does everywhere, preaches in the synagogue, and then gets uh, turned out and, and um, uh, finds an alternative. Um, and it's there that he's joined by um, Silas and Timothy, turns to the Gentiles and he stays 18 months in Corinth, which uh, I'll come back to that later on. And, um, and then um, uh, the Jews turn against him and he sails on to Ephesus where he takes Aquila and Priscilla with him. He leaves them there. He spends some time in the synagogue in Ephesus. They want him to stay longer, but he, but he moves on, um, sails back eventually to Jerusalem and, and returns to Antioch. And, um, as I understand it, Acts 18, um, 22 is the, is the, the end of his second trip. And um, Acts 18, 23 is the start of his third trip. And uh, well, again, we'll come back to that in a moment. So, so towards the end of Acts 18, he sets off on, on a third trip um, and um, makes his way, um, first of all, through Galatia, uh, Apollos uh, meets Aquila and Priscilla in Ephesus. Paul then goes on to Corinth. And then in Acts 19, which I think is about a year after he was 
very briefly in Ephesus. He returns to Ephesus. And we'll read that section in a moment. He meets the 12 disciples, spends two years establishing the church there, writes 1 Corinthians, confronts demons and witchcraft. Um, then he sends Timothy and Titus ahead of him to Macedonia, spends a bit more time in Ephesus. Uh, there's a riot concerning the goddess Artemis. And then in Acts 20, um, leaves for Macedonia, spends some time there, writes 2 Corinthians, goes on to Corinth, where he spends three months and writes Romans. He was pretty busy, Paul, wasn't he? And then, uh, and then um, returns through Macedonia to Troas, raises Eutychus from the dead, sails on to Miletus, which is near Ephesus, um, probably... Um, about a year after he left there, where he meets the Ephesian elders and says his farewell. So, um, with that kind of context in mind, if we could just read together Acts 19, uh, 1 to 12, and then, and then a few verses from Acts 20, and I'm reading from the Holman translation. Acts 19. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul travelled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism uh, were you bapt? Then with what baptism were you baptized? He asked them. With John's baptism, they replied. And Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one who would come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began to speak with other languages and to prophesy. Now there were about 12 men in all. And then he entered the synagogue and spoke boldly over a period of three months, engaging in discussion and trying to persuade them about the things related to the kingdom of God. But when some became hardened and would not believe, slandering the way in front of the crowd, he withdrew from them and met separately with the disciples, conducting discussions every day in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And this went on for two years, so that all the inhabitants of the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hand, so that even face cloths or work aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. So we'll just pause there, then we'll move on about a year to Acts 20, verse 17. Um, now, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they came to him, he said to them, you know, from the first day I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time serving the Lord with all humility, with tears, and with the trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews, and that I did not shrink back from pro proclaiming to you anything that was profitable, or from teaching it to you in public and from house to house. I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I'm on my way to Jerusalem, bound in my spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there, except that in town after town, the Holy Spirit testifies to me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. But I count my life of no value to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. And now I know that none of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will ever see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of everyone's blood, for I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole plan of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And men from among yourselves will rise up with deviant doctrines to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for three years, 
I did not stop warning each of you with tears. And now I commit you to God and to the message of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands have provided for my needs and for those who are with me. In every way, I've shown you that by laboring like this, it is necessary to help the weak and to keep in mind the words of the Lord Jesus. For he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. After he said this, he knelt down and prayed with all of them. And there was a great deal of weeping by everyone. And embracing Paul, they kissed him, grieving most, over, most of all over his statement that they would never see his face again. And then they escorted him to the ship. So, um, if time permits, <laughs> uh, there's, there's six things I'd like to share with you that I, I feel are actions that are most needed at this time um, in our setting and, and I, I believe in, in yours as well. And, and the first is this, um, uh, we must fortify the foundations um, fortify the foundations. Acts 19 um, has this uh, incredible opening statement. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus and he found some disciples and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Um, and just picking up from his, from his statements in Acts 20, he speaks about not shrinking back from proclaiming to you anything that was profitable or teaching it to you in public and from house to house, I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus. So Paul arrives in Ephesus for you know, this, this sort of second, second and, and, and major time there, uh, met 12 men and, and knew immediately that something was missing. So his first question is, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And um, I'm very challenged by that as an opening question. I don't, I don't think I've ever used it. Um, but Paul knows something is lacking. And in meeting them, he knows something is lacking. It's, it's pretty clear that these, these 12 had been converted through Apollos' ministry. Apollos um, uh, doesn't, Apollos, before Aquila and Priscilla get their hands on him, has a deficient gospel. Um, and so Paul's question gets right to the root of the problem. They need to be baptized into Christ and in water and in the Holy Spirit. And um, he ensures the gaps are filled, baptizes them in water, um, lays his hands on them. They, are, they receive the Holy Spirit. They speak in tongues and they prophesy. And, and as Paul says, I didn't shrink back from proclaiming to you anything that would be profitable. And, and for Paul, it starts with the basics, repentance and faith and the baptisms in, uh, in water and in the Holy Spirit. And of course, when we read back through Acts, uh, starting right back in Acts chapter 2, um, when Paul is asked on the day of Pentecost, verse 36, um, I beg your pardon, Paul in verse 36 proclaims, his revelation that he, that he himself had in Matthew 16, that Jesus is the Christ. And here in Acts, and Jesus gives him the keys of the kingdom on that occasion uh, and says he'll build his church upon that revelation. In Acts chapter 2, when he's, when he's proclaimed that Jesus has been, has been raised from the dead, has ascended on high, has poured out the Spirit, um, he's, he, he ends in verse 36. He says, know that this Jesus is Lord and Messiah. That, that's the revelation Peter's received, that Jesus is Lord, he's Messiah, he's the Christ. And the, 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 the crowd in Acts 2 say, um, brothers, what, what must we do? They cut to the heart. What must we do? And, and Peter's reply is, is um, I'm sure for all of us, it, is, it sets out these basic foundations. Verse 38 of Acts, Acts chapter 2, repent. Peter says to them, be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus, the Messiah, 
for the forgiveness of your sins. And, and number three, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I, I see Peter in Acts 2 using, using the keys of the kingdom to, to unlock for them the way in to the kingdom is through repentance and faith and baptism and receiving the gift of the Spirit. And um, of course, Hebrews 6, which also talks about the foundations, starts with those things, repentance and faith and baptisms, plural. And I, I just think they're basics for a reason. They're, they're foundations for a reason. In, in Acts chapter 1, Paul has commanded them, you must not leave Jerusalem until you've received the gift my father promised. John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized in or with the Holy Spirit. So, so Jesus himself has, has, has commanded the, the 12 and, and the 120 perhaps to, to wait until all the basics, all the foundations are in place. And um, in fortifying the foundations, which I believe is a really essential action for us, especially at this time, which, which we'll come on to. And when we go through the book of Acts, we, we find that part of the apostolic task, I believe, is ensuring those things are always in place. That's, that's part of the foundational ministry. So we find in Acts 8, Peter and John meet um, some of Philip's converts in Samaria who've been baptized in water but not yet received the Holy Spirit. And, and so Peter and John uh, come up from Jerusalem and lay hands on them. And that happens. They receive the Spirit. Then in Acts 10, um, uh, once Jesus has baptized Cornelius' household in the Holy Spirit and they begin to speak in tongues, Peter says, right, now you must, now you must immediately be baptized in water. And... Um, there are various other ex examples of, of baptism in water um, being the immediate need of people, the Ethiopian. Why, why can't I be baptized? Paul in Acts 9 himself, you know, as soon as Ananias has, has laid hands on him, he, he's immediately baptized. Lydia and her household in Acts 16, the jailer in Acts 16. We, we see these, these foundations, these, these things always, always in place. And here now in Acts um, in Acts 19, Paul uh, rectifies uh, the deficiencies that have been left by Apollos' earlier ministry. Um, and I think this is key for all of us. And, uh, and I want for myself to be um, humble enough and open enough that others can always come alongside and supplement or extend um, what we've built. And and, um, and particularly regarding the foundational things, I would regard those, those three in Acts 2.38, repent, be baptized, receive the Spirit as, as absolutely foundational and, um, and, and bedrocks in, in the lives of the church and not additional things, not supplementary things, but vital that they're in place. And, and um, Paul says, uh, I, we didn't shrink back. I just, I just want to say we can't shrink back from giving everybody everything they need. Uh, we mustn't shortchange God's people. Where, where, where we're able to lead people into an experience of the foundations, we must do that because, because they're essential for people. And um, in, in Ephesus, um, it's interesting, isn't it? Having, having first dealt with what was first needed, putting these foundations in place, um, it, Paul goes on to uh, verse, verse 8, it says, to um, boldly over a period of three months engage in discussions concerning the kingdom of God. And I'll come back to that in, in my second point, concerning the kingdom of God. And, and it goes on to say then he, he performed extraordinary miracles. We always find that intriguing, don't we? W what category of miracle raises it? to the level of extraordinary. <laughs> but, but I just think Paul here, um, he's got the basics in place, he's got the foundations in place, and then he can build upon them with teaching and demonstration of the kingdom of God, which I'll, I'll come on to a, a bit more in a moment. If we want to build churches which are strong in word and spirit, 
in doctrine and in demonstration, which I'm sure is our hearts, I hope is our hearts, then the, the foundations must be in place and, and the quality of the foundations will always show up eventually. We know that Jesus, Jesus' parable of the two builders, one, one on sand, one on rock. Um, in, um, in Luke 6, his version of, those, of that parable, it says the builder dug deep and laid the foundations on a rock. Uh, at my experience, and I'm preaching to myself now, is is we can never really overdo the foundations in people's lives. Every time I, I'm involved in teaching our, our um, you know, welcome to the church course, I get so blessed every time we talk about repentance and baptism and being filled with the spirit. So, so one of the questions we might consider later is, um, does that mean as much to us as it did to Paul? Are we happy sometimes to let things drift, leave it months before baptizing people, not asking people if they've received the spirit or, or, or not following through on our own, uh, our own um, realization that they perhaps haven't, um, not shrinking back from laying biblical foundations. Um, I think this time of, of, of the pandemic has, has really, as I'm sure we've, we've all said many times, really shown up the roots in people's lives uh, and the need for strong roots. And I feel as a ministry of Christ um, and as leaders in the church, we have a responsibility to give people everything they need and, and not, not shrinking back in these areas. Um, so that, that's kind of the first thing I wanted to say. And just, just um, moving on a little bit on, on some of the things I just mentioned. The second point, is that we keep preaching the kingdom. Um, I just read the verse in, in Acts 19, verse 8. He entered the synagogue. He spoke for three months about the things of the kingdom of God. And in, and in Acts 20, when he's, when he's um, summarizing his time with them, he says, I went to about preaching the kingdom of God. And in fact, in this case, he says, I didn't shrink back. He uses the same phrase. I didn't shrink back from declaring to you, verse 27 of Acts 20, the whole plan of God. How, how we'd have loved to have been in those sessions, eh? Paul telling us about the whole plan of God. Um, um, Luke, Luke tells us, Paul confirms it, that the, that the main uh, thrust of Paul's teaching was the kingdom of God, which as we know was, was Jesus's focus. Um, he preached the good news of the kingdom. Um, was Paul's focus right to the end? He's there in Acts 28 in his, in his own rented house in Rome, preaching the kingdom. Um, Acts chapter 1 tells us that in those 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension, Jesus um, gave many convincing proofs that he was alive and spoke about the kingdom of God. I think one of the reasons we have so little in the New Testament to help us um, to, to instruct us about church meetings or church structure or, um, you know, what to do in a home group or what, what's, what, what, what's the format for a Sunday morning. There's, there's nothing there because, because for 40 days, actually what concerned Jesus was to talk to them about the kingdom. The kingdom of God is the good news. Um, um, the church, the church is only the result of the kingdom. The church is only the, the, the outcome of the kingdom being preached, but the kingdom of God, the message that Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that a new regime has come, that we've been transferred out of the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his son. Um, that's the good news. Jesus is King. He deals with sin and sickness and demons and poverty and injustice. Um, as somebody has said, I love this quote, the, the kingdom of God is God's total answer to man's total need. The kingdom of God is God's total answer to man's total need. That's uh, E. Stanley Jones. The, it's the kingdom that's the answer, uh, not the church. Well, the church has a part in it, but only as the, as the, 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 the message of the church is the kingdom. That the kingdom of God, that the rule of God precedes the church. The reign of God will, will last 
way beyond the church, if I could put it that way, um, the, the good news is the kingdom. Now, the church should be good news as well. I mean, that, uh, that's obvious. The church should be great news. But our message is, is not how great the church is. Our message is how great the king is, how great the kingdom is, how, how we have a king who's, who's lord of all, who's sovereign, who's ruling and reigning, who, who as, as it says in Colossians, creates all things, sustains all things, redeems all things, restores all things. This is the king. This is the kingdom. And I just think it's really vital that we give people a vision of the kingdom. Um, just talking about the church is far too small. We must give people a vision of the kingdom. It, the, the, the good news is not my church coming in my town or our congregation coming in our village. The good news is, is God's kingdom coming in all the earth and, if you will, in all the heavens as well. The, um, there's a beautiful um, description of this in, in the message translation of, of Colossians 1, of, of the kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven, where, where it says this. Um, well, it's hard to know where to start and end with this one. From beginning to end, he's there, towering far above everything, everyone. So spacious is he, so roomy, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. It's the kingdom that's, that's great news. And, um, and uh, the kingdom is, is the great news for our towns and villages. I'm sure you love these scriptures as I do. Matthew 9 and Matthew 4. Jesus went to all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Jesus, Jesus loved the towns and villages. And, and his good news for them was the kingdom. So I'll, I'll kind of, I'll end, I'll end part one with this. It, it's really vital that our, our preaching and our teaching is big enough. It, it, it has to have kingdom dimensions to it. Jesus is, um, God is restoring all things. Jesus is making all things new. Jesus is king over every disease and every sickness. His kingdom is coming. And uh, it's, it's just great that we get to play a part in that. So that's that that's that's great and 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 um what what an encouragement for us to you know coming back to those foundations.